At the end of the Arctic winter, non-stop chattering accompanies the clearing Labrador fog. In this dark world cloaked by a giant ice sheet, ghost-like marine animals chatter continuously, probably to stay in touch, perhaps to break the dark silence. Occasionally, one of them interrupts the conversation to go and explore the frozen labyrinths. This is a chapter in one of those journeys. March. After six months' absence, rays of sunlight stage a timid comeback to Baffin Bay, west of Greenland. At 75 degrees north, air temperatures don't rise above minus 10. This white, hostile desert seems totally devoid of life. However, underneath the ice sheet, Sponges, anemones, and soft corals survive throughout the year, filtering organic debris in water at zero degrees. The return of light stimulates these organisms, giving them a chance to boost energy levels by photosynthesis. Day breaks at last on the mirages of Arctic life. There's nothing animal about these long screeches. It's the sound of the ice cracking. On the surface, the only signs of this distortion are these pressure ridges formed by the ice sheet's movement. The end of March brings the arrival of airborne messengers, common guillemots. They leave Labrador to head off northwards towards Baffin Bay, where the sun will reign for the spring and summer months. The guillemots are not alone in heading for the ice sheet. White dolphins or beluga take the same route. On their journey, they're often forced to swim under the ice in complete darkness. This young female, Isla, is the group's scout. Her mission? To find holes in the ice sheet, leading to zones free from ice and full of food. A good mouthful of air allows 15 minutes underwater exploration. When her time's up, Isla must find an opening big enough to squeeze her three tons through. This one is too narrow. She continues her quest, swimming on her back to find breathing holes. Well, it's not going to be this one, or that one. Isla emits sound pulses, which are amplified by her melon, the prominent lump on her forehead, which is filled with a mass of fat. We'll soon discover what these sound emissions are used for. Above Isla, the ice sheet continues to be deformed by the sun, wind and water currents. It doesn't take long before the movement of these ice blocks exposes large stretches of water. Isla has found a suitable hole. Now she can pass on a signal through the ice labyrinths, a beluga telegram, saying something like, This is Isla. Found opening. Come and join me. It's a message she'll repeat tirelessly.
These calls have a frequency in the range of 20 to 150,000 hertz, and they can reach across distances of more than five kilometers. The sound travels near the water's surface, channeled by the melted ice layers, which are of a feeble density and not too salty. But it's not just sound which travels in this water. Medusas and plankton can be found in these layers too. Meanwhile, Isla's group, some 30 beluga, has received the message and heads off on the path she's indicated. The group has traveled thousands of miles north from the waters off the coast of Labrador where they wintered. It won't be long before they find Isla, who continues to broadcast her message. Her companions catch up with her at last. All she has to do is guide them towards the stretch of free water she's discovered. It's only one step on the long journey towards the Great North and its promises of rich feasts. They've reached the entrance to the tunnel under the ice. Isla goes first, making sure the others follow. One way to prevent getting lost in the dark is by communicating. The chattering starts up again. It's a series of clicks which are formed in the larynx, then purified and amplified by the very fine oil contained in the melon. When the sound waves hit an obstacle, they are sent on in echo form and analyzed by the brain, which uses them to compose a precise image of the surroundings. Thanks to their biological sonar, the beluga can see with their ears in the dark. At the group's head, the dominant female. Her fins are withered and her form bulky with age. She swims here in a tight subgroup with her daughters, granddaughters and their offspring. The immature beluga, recognizable from its slate gray color, is unable to navigate alone through the dark ice labyrinths. So the young remain just behind their mother's back, where they can swim effortlessly in their wake. During the ride, the calf learns to emit clicks. He invents a sound which is all his own, a sort of signature. This cry will be important for registering his presence. Isla and the dolphin phantoms are going to disappear for a time in the underwater night. Where will they go to feed? Nobody knows. It's the spectre's secret. But on their way, they will meet other ghost-like creatures. June. The midnight sun heats up the still air mass. The air in contact with the ice becomes warmer and less dense than the ambient air. It deflects light rays, deforming the landscape to make it seem like a world peopled by mirages. A Greenland right whale or a Biscay whale? We'll never know. Underwater commentaries about these strange visions are in full swing. But this is not the beluga's familiar cries and whistles. 
It sounds more like singing exercises or squeaking doors. These mermaids are as loquacious as their cousins the beluga, but even more elusive. Narwhals. Their name alone evokes ancient mariners' tales. Barrel-like bodies, mottled with white, fan-shaped tail flukes. Nothing very spectacular about that. In fact, the narwhal became a legend because of a tooth. Its left canine, which is between two to three meters long, and which earned it the nickname of Sea Unicorn. Perhaps the long-held belief that the narwhal was a myth came about partly because it is rare and difficult to find. These pictures are perhaps the first to reveal some of this elusive animal's secrets. It used to be thought that its spiral tusk, which is almost exclusively a male characteristic, was used to spear fish. In fact, it's a sound amplifier and allows the narwhal to emit its squeaks and groans within a radius of more than eight kilometers. Each narwhal announces its vocal repertoire with a unique screeching sound, which the others use to identify the soloist. Everyone can take part in the conversation, as long as the rules are followed. The cries which accompany the grindings are structured by themes with regular breaks and light motives, changes of rhythm and silences. Like the beluga, the weaned young emit clicks from the outskirts of the group to practice building acoustic pictures of their surroundings. Among them is Bianca, an adolescent, recognizable from her white belly. Her sonar has alerted her to the presence of a stranger in the darkness. Her group dozes on the surface, scattered out along the direction of the ice flow without suspecting that a stranger is approaching under the ice crust. It's Isla. She left her group to discover the source of these strange metallic grinding sounds. For the time being, Isla and Bianca watch each other from a wary distance. They try to communicate, but it's no good. They don't speak the same language. Intrigued, Bianca's companions approach. Isla is quickly surrounded by the narwhals and seems to think it wise to call for help from her own kind. Message received. First to arrive is a group of males. Facing them is a group of young narwhals with Bianca at their head. The entire beluga group now hurries over to observe the narwhals. A young narwhal tries to establish peaceful contact. But suddenly, a great narwhal knight comes to brandish his sword before a group of male beluga. Even if beluga and narwhals can't understand each other's language of cries and screeches, body language holds no mysteries. For one and all, the release of bubbles is interpreted as a threat. The narwhal knight persists. But the beluga, sure of their superiority in size and number, decide to teach the narwhal a lesson. The incident is serious enough for the narwhals to launch a series of intimidatory attacks. But bluffing with bubbles is a trick the beluga know well too. The threats escalate, although somewhat half-heartedly on the narwhal's side. All the animals end up getting involved, even the groups of females. 
but the bubble exchanges gradually become less aggressive and turn into more of a game. The threats are over, and the two species are happy to get on with one another. The narwhal knight has swallowed his pride, and he invites one of the youngsters from his group to greet the visiting beluga with him. Here's the group of females. This one must be a scout like Bianca. But the knight is soon bored with introductions and entrusts the novice to a female in his group. Seeing this, Isla seems to have had an idea. She goes to tell the matriarch about it. It looks like her idea has been accepted. Bianca is reunited with the females and their calves, who are rather agitated. Something's happening, but what? She understands once her sonar has informed her that the female beluga, under guidance of their matriarch, are drawing up to the female narwhals. But not all the females, only those who have a calf. The female narwhals don't understand the maneuvers and instinctively draw back. From a distance, they observe the female beluga assembling their calves. Meanwhile, the young female beluga, without young, swim off to join the immature narwhals. Isla's idea to create a common crash is beginning to take shape. To ensure the young of both groups are protected, the beluga and narwhals will travel part of the way together, forming a collective escort around the mothers. End of August. The light begins to diminish and mirages are succeeded by blizzards. With the wind blowing in a northerly direction at more than 180 kilometers an hour, the drifting ice is blown up against the ice sheet. The swell breaks up these immense ice plates into blocks which obstruct the water breaches. Rotten weather for the Arctic phantoms, who are already obliged to return to the calmer waters further south. In the lead, of course, is Isla. She is determined to find a quiet spot where her group can converse in peace. Once she's crossed the Davis Straits, Isla finds calmer waters. But there's no life in this tranquil sea, and no life means no food. In the absence of wind, the seawater freezes without a sound. But freezing seawater means danger for Isla. There's only one solution, to continue south, running the risk of getting caught in the new ice formations. The Labrador Sea an enormous expanse of water and sonars. Isla navigates using magnetic particles in her brain, which are sensitive to the Earth's magnetic field. But even with this biological compass, beluga prefer to travel along the length of the coast. She's reached Cumberland Sound, south of Baffin Island. The water is calm and rich in plankton, giving it its blue-green color.
Isla discovers with interest the traces of another community, man. These unfortunate creatures are not equipped with brains sensitive to the Earth's magnetic field. They need markers to find their way, so they position buoys. Curiously, Isla can't resist the feel of this strange material. What a lot of news she'll have for the other beluga. On the seabed, she finds more proof of man's presence. This rough material is great for a good scratch. The water here is warmer than the temperatures Isla's accustomed to in Baffin Bay, and she has to cool off. To do this, she needs to get rid of a layer of thick and itchy skin cells. These ropes seem to be linked to a giant object floating on the surface. An abandoned schooner. Not far from this phantom ship, another floating object has attracted Isla's curiosity. It's a little boat, wood, plastic, metal. Which of these new materials will make the best exfoliator? Isla finds the propeller to her liking, so she has a go. Beluga need as abrasive a material as possible to help them get rid of their dead skin cells. Once the job's done, the epidermis is lubricated by small secretions of oil droplets and carbohydrates. When the skin is soft and smooth, aquatic drag is reduced to a minimum. Isla interrupts her exfoliation session because her sonar has just detected something moving on the sea floor. A young halibut, one of the beluga's favorite prey. Isla could easily make a mouthful of it, but she's not in a hurry. She has other plans for her victim. She hadn't quite finished her beauty treatment, and she decides the halibut's rough scales would make an excellent back scrub. The halibut is an ideal prey for beluga. Not only is it useful for exfoliation, its flesh is full of energy and rich in vitamins and oil. So, for really complete care, Isla simply has to eat her back scrub after use. End of October. There's no autumn in the Arctic. In the dwindling light, ice has covered over the water-filled trenches, invading Baffin Bay and the Davis Straits. The airborne messengers head back towards the grey skies of Labrador. Once again, they're the first to arrive, but a long line of emigrants follows them closely along the coastline. With mothers and calves at the center of the group, the narwhals make the journey south, following the head of the ice flow. Isla's group escorts the narwhals, keeping a watchful eye on the young females. To stay in touch on the journey, each one clicks its identifying sound. During the trip, Groups are formed through affinity, 
Bianca has teamed up with another female of the same age. Some young males enjoy moving between groups. The dominant female with her clan lead the group towards the Cumberland Sound where Isla is waiting for them. She's heard their chattering and heads out of the sound to meet them. She has news for them of phantom ships and edible back brushes. But first, she must find the matriarch. On the way, the Narwhal and Beluga group has split up into several scattered subgroups. Isla must get to the head of the group to find the matriarch's clan. But where is it? She's found them at last. However, her companions must be willing to listen. Rules in Beluga language mean Isla must first announce her intentions. It's done. Now Isla can tell them all the latest gossip. Oh, my God.